Welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mary Asham. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Joining me today is Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman, former NASA astronaut and currently a professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT. Dr. Hoffman has the unique distinction of being the first Jewish American male astronaut in space. Dr. Hoffman made his first space flight as a mission specialist in 1985 on the shuttle Discovery. He took part in four other space flights, including the first mission to repair the Hubble Space Telescope in 1993, leaving the astronaut program in 1997 to become NASA's European representative in Paris, where he served until 2001. Dr. Hoffman and I will speak about the journey that led him to join NASA, what it was like to spin a dreidel in space, and how flying above the Earth impacted his global perspective. We'll also talk about his current Mars work and some tips for overcoming the isolation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Hoffman, welcome. Wonderful to have you with us today. Yeah, good to be here. Um, nice to be able to do something with B'nai B'rith. Uh, my maternal grandfather was very, very active and, and had some awards, Samuel Kornfeld. Uh, and, um, and so I've always had a good place in my heart for B'nai B'rith. So thanks for inviting me. Well, it's our pleasure and that's a good connection to make as, as we begin our conversation today. Uh, before we talk about all of your accomplishments, uh, take us back to what motivated you to become interested in astrophysics and how your love for space blossomed. And uh, we know that as youngsters, and I'm, I'm in your generation, um, there was uh, no space program to rally around. Um, there was space and there were some projects that our government had engaged in, but there really wasn't uh, a program. So how did you get to be interested in, in, in space? All right, well, um, I, I spent my childhood uh, in New York City um, and the suburbs. And this was in the 1950s, which, um, you know, it was, it was before Sputnik, but it was the dawn of the space age. I mean, we were launching sounding rockets uh, out in New Mexico, um, and there was lots of science fiction on television, on the radio, which I, I ate up. I mean, Flash Gordon, Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Um, I, with my best friend, actually, um, when, when we used to play after school, uh, we didn't play cowboys and Indians, we played spaceman. You know, we'd shoot each other with ray guns instead of six shooters. And actually, he came to my first launch and uh, back in 1985, and, and he commented to me afterwards, he said, Jeff, I can't believe it. You know, the little boy I used to play space cadet with is actually going up into space. So, but anyway, um, uh, it was not just the uh, the upcoming space program, and of course there there were articles in in Collier's magazine, Life magazine, um, on on the Walt Disney World television. They had Tomorrowland about space, um, and um, you know my my parents wanted to take advantage of all the cultural activities in in New York City. They took me to concerts and museums and and the Hayden Planetarium. And there, uh, I mean, I, it's hard to know exactly what it was, but um, there was something about understanding the motion of the planets and perceiving how far away the stars and galaxies were, um, e even though, you know, we, we didn't have a clue of how big the universe really was like we do now, but still, it was really big. And, and, and so there were these two aspects of space. There was space as something that's fascinating to study and also space as a place that someday people could go to. I mean, it represented the future, space travel. So, uh, you know, I, I vividly remember Sputnik. Uh, my dad took me and, and some of my friends out to the high school football field and we watched this incredible thing go over. You know, Nowadays we take it for granted, but nobody had seen anything like that before. And, and the older brother of, of my best friend, who I, the, the one I talked about before playing Space Kid, he was a ham radio operator. And he picked up these beeps from Sputnik and he got a front page on the local town newspaper. I mean, it, it was an incredible time. 
uh, the excitement and then the space race, uh, you know, who's going to launch uh, someone into space first. And, and we saw Yuri Gagarin, Alan Shepard, John Glenn. And at that point, I mean, every red blooded American boy wanted to be an astronaut. Um, unfortunately, there, there weren't role models for girls back then, but now, fortunately, there are so boys and girls can aspire to it. But in any case, um, I as well, I thought, hey, this would be really fun. I'd love to go into space. But um, it was pretty clear all the early astronauts were military test pilots, and that was not a career for me. But my interest in space as something to study, astronomy persisted. I was I, I always liked school, I did well in it. Um, and uh, I, I went to uh, Amherst College, uh, took the introductory astronomy course, found, uh, yeah, I, I really do enjoy this and, and went on eventually to get an ast uh, a doctorate in, in high energy astrophysics at Harvard um, and was well established on a scientific career. I, I did a, um, a postdoctoral work over at the University of Leicester uh, in the UK. And this was doing space astronomy because high energy astrophysics, we look at X-rays, gamma rays that don't penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, luckily for us, but they're very interesting to study. So you have to send up sounding rockets or eventually satellites. Uh, from there, um, after actually marrying a lovely English woman and, and we had a son born over there. Uh, so I came back uh, to start work at MIT, again, in uh, space astrophysics, we had a, a satellite which, which we were operating. And I assumed that that was, I, you know, I was on my way to an academic career as a professor somewhere, but um, that was now in the mid to late 70s, which is when NASA was developing what was then the brand new space shuttle. And the thing about the space shuttle was it had a crew of up to seven people, but they only needed two pilots. And that meant that's what really opened up the astronaut program to scientists, engineers, medical doctors. And when I saw NASA's announcement that they wanted to recruit astronauts specifically for the space shuttle, and they didn't just want pilots, they wanted scientists and engineers and medical doctors. So I thought, hey, this is something I've dreamed about. I never thought it was a realistic career prospect, but I applied and, and along with about 8,000 other people, but I was fortunate enough to be one of the, uh, as we called ourselves, the TFNG, the 35 new guys and gals, because uh, that was also the group where we had the first women uh, in the space program. And, of course, since then, the astronaut corps has become far more diverse, and which is a good thing. Still plenty of pilots, but uh, there's lots of scientists and engineers. And uh, of course, that changed my life. But, I want to go back to I want to go back to the, the 35, if I can. Sure. Although, I, you know, you mentioned mentioned Alan Shepard. Uh, I was uh, in the well, seventh grade. New Hampshire. Which, New which Hampshire. I, I was in the seventh grade and uh, in New Hampshire in, in elementary. In, junior high school, and they called all of the students into the school cafeteria uh, to see uh, the launch. Uh, the state of New Hampshire was, of course, extremely proud of Alan Shepard. He was from Derry, New Hampshire. Uh, his parents were living at the time, and there were interviews with his parents. And there was a certain excitement, of course, in the country. Everybody was excited, but especially in New Hampshire. And I want to go back to MIT. You were at the Center for Space Research. Uh, from 75 to 78, and you were focusing on work with X-ray bursts. Yeah. And now you mentioned 8,000 applicants, 35, who were, was winnowed down to 35. You were one of the 35. What was it in the work that you were doing that caught the eye of NASA? Well, I'd say there were several things. Um, first of all, as far as my work, um, I, I had... For my doctoral work, I had built a payload and flew it on high altitude balloons. So, I mean, I had hands-on experience working in the laboratory, programming computers, fixing things. That's the sort of things astronauts do. Being able to, to work in time critical situations when you're counting down to a rocket launch. Um, so I had experience with, with those things professionally. 
And then in my private life, um, I mean, I've, I've always liked to do um, exciting things. I, I, mean, I was a sport parachuter, a mountain climber. Um, and I guess I had some good stories to tell about some of my experiences there. I was a, I studied navigation uh, at Harvard and at celestial navigation and actually was, got a, a berth as navigator on, on a uh, 110 foot uh, Norwegian coastal steamer, which again, some good stories to tell at the selection board interview. So uh, it was a combination of, of my professional background and um, you know, some of the other things that I had done. You know, you, you want people as astronauts who are able to function in time critical, potentially um, dangerous, uh, physically dangerous situations. And, and I had proved that I, I could handle myself uh, like that, as well as all of my academic credentials were, were good. And, and uh, I mean, it was kind of fun because they, uh, you know, as the selection process goes on, uh, I start to get calls from my friends. Um, that was the summer of 77. Hey, Jeff, there's this this guy from the government's been around asking all these questions about you. What's going on? You know, but that's a good, actually, side. A good thing because it means I was eventually made it into the finalists and got invited down to Houston to the Johnson Space Center for a week of medical exams and interviews. And, and then, uh, of course, waiting around for the actual call, um, which finally came early January of 1977, not 1978. Um, you know, the call says, hey, uh, Jeff, you still want to be an astronaut? Like, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, congratulations. And uh, I was actually on a ski trip with my family in, in Sun Valley at the time. And, and uh, unbeknownst to me, my dad had put a bottle of champagne in the fridge. He didn't tell me about it in case I didn't get selected, but um, we popped it out and had a nice family celebration. That was a nice touch. So you're working for NASA for a few years, and then in 1985, you made your first space flight as a mission specialist on the space shuttle Discovery. How did you prepare for that, for that first launch? Um, and is there even a realistic way to prepare for liftoff? Obviously, it's hard to simulate something that extreme, so take us through that process. Yeah, well, um, I, I should say my uh, the experiences leading up to my first flight uh, were were rather unusual, even even in those days of of the shuttle, where you know the shuttle we were just figuring out how to operate it. Um, flights were getting delayed, postponed, canceled, switched around, payloads got changed. I was first assigned to a flight uh, that would have gone in June of 1984. Um, but the previous flight in March got canceled for various reasons. And so that crew moved ahead. They took our flight. We got put onto a flight in August of 1984. And we had to do a complete new training, including learning how to do rendezvous and operate the robotic arm, uh, which had not been a part of the first flight. And, um, and then the June flight had a, a, a problem and they combined the June flight with some of the payloads from the August flight. We got bumped off that flight into yet another flight in January of 1985. And we trained for that again, completely different training. Um, about a week before we were supposed to launch that flight got canceled. So we were put on yet another completely different flight in April of 1985, and it turned out that one of the um, satellites which we, which we launched didn't turn on properly, and so NASA decided that the way to fix that was to uh, send me and my colleague out in spacesuits to to do a repair activity. So that that was the first time NASA had ever done an unplanned, what they call a contingency spacewalk. And of course that gave me my spacewalking credentials, which eventually led to 
being on the mission to repair the Hubble Space Telescope, which was certainly the most significant thing I ever did. So you asked about how you prepare for liftoff. Well, I mean, we spend a tremendous amount of times in the simulators, and of course they, they shake the simulators around and, and make a lot of noise, but everybody I had spoken to who had actually ridden on the shuttle um, told me you know, there's, there's no way just be prepared for more vibration and noise than you can ever imagine. Uh, you, you don't really prepare for it. I mean, the day comes and, and uh, you know, we've gone through a, a dress rehearsal a month before. So we, we knew the procedure about, you know, getting suited up and going up the elevator, getting in strapped into the shuttle and, and so on. But um, now we're doing it for real. And, um, it's not like you're prepared for it, but you hear the countdown, you know, five, uh, 10, nine, eight, uh, you, you start to feel things shaking. And then the next thing you know, at T zero, you get this big kick in the pants when the solid boosters light. And all of a sudden, sure enough, there's more vibration and noise than I ever thought was possible. Um, and, and I, uh, it, it, you know, the kind of emotional reaction, particularly when we went through Mach 1 and the wings start vibrating and, and, and there's just so much vibration. I thought to myself, again, this was just an emotional response. This, this, can't, be, this can't be right. I mean, there can't be this much vibration. So the wings are going to fall off or something. But, you know, intellectually, I knew that the shuttle had flown you know, 15 times before and the wings had never fallen off and they probably weren't going to fall off this time. And sure enough, they didn't. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking with you. Um, and it's um, that that part of the flight only lasts for about two minutes. The vibration comes mostly from those two big solid rocket boosters. They fall off after they've done their job. And then it's really quite a smooth ride the rest of the way up into orbit. Uh, the, the G's come on a little bit, but the shuttle never pulled more than about three G's, which any healthy person can take. It's not particularly comfortable, but um, the thing that I will never forget, though, is, um, you know, you go through this overwhelming experience of launch, and then all of a sudden, it gets quiet, and you feel yourself floating out of your seat. I released the safety harness, floated over to the window, and there was the curve of the Earth's horizon, and I could just see the continent of Africa coming over the horizon. And that's when it all of a sudden hit me. I'm actually in space, I'm in orbit, you know? I've dreamed about this since I was a little kid and I'm, I'm in orbit. And I just couldn't stop smiling for hours. It was just such an exhilarating experience. And I never got tired of it for all my five flights. I, I love space, it's a, it's a wonderful, totally different environment, being weightless, being able to look down on our incredible planet. Uh, I've, I've been very fortunate. You made the comment that I think on the repair of the uh, Hubble telescope, that you were, you were 400 miles up between there and heaven. So it, it must be a, a just a tremendous um, high, um, literally and figuratively, uh, to be able to be it, 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 that just have that perspective uh, to look down on the earth and then to look up into the heavens. Absolutely. I mean, I've always, my wife and I have a joke whenever we travel, uh, if there's a hill that you can climb up to the top of or a tower that you can go, I, I, I always like to get what, what she calls the, the overview. Um, and um, I, I tell you, it, it, it uh, you know, to, to be able to look down from, from 400 miles, uh, that's quite an overview. So, yeah, I never got tired of looking out the window. Well, you went on to make four more trips to space, including one in 1993 uh, aboard the Endeavour uh, to repair the, the Hubble telescope. Uh, during that mission, uh, you played a, a televised game of dreidel, which you spun for an hour, it must be some kind of uh, record at least in space, um, but you also took with you on subsequent missions, uh, you took Mesozot, you took menorahs, um, you, you even had, I think, a talesim made for your sons um, to, to take well, with actually, you. Um, it was the Atarot, 
uh, the, the little inscription that goes. The inscription. We, we had a, what happened was, but it, this was even- but, but more importantly, the Torah oh, scroll. So we want to talk about all we'll, of that. We'll, we'll get to that because that was sort of the culmination. But even before my first flight, I mean, we, we belonged to a synagogue uh, not far from the Johnson Space Center in, in Clear Lake, Texas, about 30 miles south of, of downtown Houston. Um, and um, the rabbi, uh, Arnold Stiebel, asked me before the flight, would, would I be interested in carrying any um, Jewish ceremonial objects with me, which I had sort of thought about, but with all the, all the other things involved in getting ready for a space flight, I hadn't really done anything. But when he made the suggestion, I said, yeah. So he put me in touch with some Jewish artisans um, who uh, two of them made mezuzot. One of them was a uh, actually, uh, you know, hand wove the, the talisim for my two sons, as well as the atarot. The talisim were, you know, we're, we're only allowed a, a small volume to take, um, you know, personal objects. And when you fold up the, the two big talisim, they were too big. So, so she removed the atarots from each of them and we flew them. And then when I got back, uh, she reattached them to the talisim. Uh, and my sons each wore them on their bar mitzvahs, and and then we used both of the talisim for the chuppahs when both of them got married many years later. So, um, and and um, with the uh, the mezuzot, some of them I've I've kept, some of them I've given to. For instance, one of them is on the uh, front door of the National Science Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, I gave one to the Jewish Museum in New York, um, and and that became kind of a, a tradition. By the time of my second flight, we had actually moved from uh, Clear Lake, Texas, closer to downtown Houston, because my wife had gotten a job uh, as a librarian and teacher at a school nearby, so, so we moved. Uh, so we were in a, a different... Um, synagogue with with a, another rabbi uh, Shaul Ozachi and um, he knew about my having taken the, these Jewish objects on my first flight so he asked if I wanted to continue and in particular he said what about taking a Torah this was already before my second flight in 1990 I said look Shaul we're you know we're, we're allowed about this much volume Torah is just not going to hack it he said well Suppose I could find a miniature Torah. Um, I said, well, you know, here are the dimensions. If it's small enough, uh, we'll see what we can do. And uh, it took him quite a while before he finally located one. I mean, it was quite a, a fascinating story. Um, he found a, a rabbi in, in New York who had uh, a, a miniature, but completely kosher and very readable um, Torah which he had gotten, I don't know, quarter of a century before in Jerusalem, but he, he was saving. He didn't really want to part with it until uh, our rabbi Osachi said, well, I have a congregant who's an astronaut who would like to take this Torah in space. And, and the rabbi in New York said, ah, that's what I've been saving it for. So our congregation uh, raised the funds to purchase the Torah and it it came to Houston, and uh, sure enough, I, I did take it into space and and performed a um, a, a small ceremony reading. Um, I, you know, shuttle flights get shifted around, and my Hebrew skills are are not great. I remember how hard I had to work to to learn the passage for for our our youngest son's bar mitzvah. So I figured, you know, if I prepare something for a specific week and they and they change the flight, I'm going to be out of luck. Um, so, so instead, I said, well, look, this is the first time the Torah has been taken and read from in space, so why don't I just start with the Bereshit, which is actually what I did in performing the ceremony. Um, the story goes on from there. That was back in 1996, my last space flight, after which I went to Paris for four years, as you said, then came back to MIT. and. And the video that, that one of my crewmates, I, I had him record the, the little ceremony that I performed. And it basically just sat on my computer for 20 years almost. 
until I was invited four years ago to the rabbinical seminary in uh, Natick or Needham, Massachusetts. Uh, I was talking about Jewish, you know, my Jewish background and, and Jews in space. And, and in the end, I showed the video of, of reading from the Torah in space. And uh, Rachel Raz, who, who was the uh, education director uh, for that, that group, uh, came up afterwards and, and said, um, you know, this, this is amazing. Um, where, where can I find this on the web? And I said, well, well, you can't. It's just on my computer. She said, but that's, that, that's terrible. I mean, this is something that should be shared. Uh, would you be willing to have a, a movie made of this? And I said, well, if it's done professionally. And, and so she actually took on the role of a movie producer. And in fact, uh, next week on the 15th, there will be uh, the, the live premiere of the Space Torah video. If people are interested in pre-register, you have to pre-register to, to view it. Um, they can go on the website spacetorahproject.com and that has a lot of information about it. So, so it was a long story, but, um, but yeah, we, uh, and, and the wonderful thing uh, about that Space Torah, there, there, there's another aspect because um, I, we left Houston and of course the Torah stayed with the congregation, but in um, 2016, which was the 20th anniversary of the flight of, of the space Torah, the uh, synagogue invited my wife and me to come down for a 20th anniversary celebration. And I was absolutely delighted to see that, you know, the Torah was not being treated as a museum piece it was sitting in the ark along with all the other Torahs and it was in active use. The, the children in the congregation love to use the space Torah for their bar and bat mitzvah readings. And of course, because it's so small, um, people who are too small to be too, you know, can't really be Hagbah and Galila and hold the big Torah, but this little miniature Torah, anybody can be Hagbah and Galila. So, so it's a living, uh, a living scroll. And, and I was delighted to see that it's, um, and, and you know, I take away, I take away, uh, I take away two things from from this story and from your experience with the mezuzot and the uh, the Hanukkiyot and and especially with the Torah. I mean, it's two things. One is uh, what a great country this is that its its astronauts uh, are able to to have even small, you know, small little packages to take with them, and in this particular case. Uh, Jewish ceremonial objects. I think it, it says a lot about our country and, and its diversity uh, and how open it is. And the second thing, it says a lot about, about you as well. You didn't have to do this. You could have you know, taken some other things as, as souvenirs later on. Uh, but you well, did I took this many other things, really, actually. I, mean, but, you know, I, I took the flag from my old Boy Scout, my son's Boy Scout troop. I took my college banner. I mean, but but the Jewish objects were were something special. You know, it, it one of the things that, that fascinated me was the, the juxtaposition of, you know, our ancient heritage. I mean, Judaism goes back thousands of years. And at the same time, space flight, which is for me, symbolic of the future, one of the newest things that humanity is doing. And to bring these two things together, it, it, it is also um, the, the fact that you know, astronauts are human beings. We're not robots. We have cultural backgrounds. And so I think it's, it's appropriate when we travel, we bring our culture with, with us. And of course, Judaism has always been a traveling religion. You know, Jews have, have traveled a, along the Silk Road. I mean, there were synagogues every six days worth of travel so that they could celebrate Shabbat and, and so on and so forth. So with just a few ceremonial objects, you can... Um, really practice most of the important aspects of Judaism. Of course, we didn't have a minion. You have to make certain compromises up there, but nevertheless. Let's go back to space. And it's a question that I think uh, a lot of uh, Americans, people around the world have. What is the hardest thing to describe about space that those who haven't been there just can't understand? That means all, all of us, pretty much all of us, because it's a small... Uh, fraternity, sorority uh, of, of astronauts. Uh, and, and the other question connected to that is, 
did flying above the earth, and you, you mentioned it before, but I'll ask it again, did flying above the earth change your perspective on life? Um, well, let's see. As far as, you know, <laughs> NASA doesn't send us up into space so that we can have personal existential experiences, okay? They send us up to do useful work, and so we spend a lot of time training, and I've done lots of useful work up there. But nevertheless, being in space is a very unique personal experience, and, and the two uh, most unique parts of it are, first of all, the view of, of the Earth, of the heavens. Um, we've done a pretty good job, I think, particularly with the IMAX cameras that, that astronauts have, have photographed the Earth from space. And if you go see some of those IMAX movies like The Blue Planet or, or many of the other movies, you, you get a, that's about as close as you can come to the visual experience of being in space without actually going there. But the most overwhelming experience is weightlessness. And unfortunately, I mean, you've seen pictures of astronauts floating around. Uh, that's about it, all we can do to share the experience. But the internal freedom of, of your body not having any weight is so unique, so totally different from anything you've experienced before. I wish it was something that more people could experience, which hopefully in the coming decade of uh, commercial space flight, maybe that will actually be true. Um, you know, language is based on shared experience. When, when I tell you that water feels wet, you know what I'm talking about because you've also felt water. But when I, when I tell you, you know, when you go into space and your body is weightlessness and you feel this incredible freedom, you've never experienced it. And, and I can talk all I want, but it's just words. Um, so uh, for me, that, that's, you know, it, it's a variety of human experience, which uh, is just totally different and unique from any, anything else that anyone has ever, ever experienced. Um, as far as changing my view of life, well, um, of course, I, I, you know, I, I, I was an astronomer before I became an astronaut, so it's not like I didn't understand that the Earth is a planet and, you know, we're in the solar system and how big the universe is and, and, and the awe-inspiring feeling of, of looking up at the stars and the Milky Way and the other galaxies and talking in terms of billions of light years. And, and so I was used to all that. But nevertheless, when you actually experience something physically, it, it does make a difference. So one, one of the first things, I guess, that, that I kept reminding myself was you know, looking out the shuttle window or, or even more so when I was in a spacesuit and, and knowing that you know, between my hand and my face, there's a vacuum. Space, the vast overwhelming majority of, of the universe is totally hostile to life. Um, and, and so it makes Earth as the home of our life e even more special. And, and I think many astronauts, even, even people who maybe not had not thought so much about it before they went up, come back with this a feeling of the in incredible uniqueness, at least in our solar system, of the Earth as, as the home of, of life, that, that um, you know, Earth has made life possible, and of course, life has transformed our planet as well. Um, when you look down at the Earth, you, you first notice the beauty. I mean, it's, it's just, I never got tired of looking at it, but when you look more closely, there's some pretty disturbing things that you, because you can really see the impact that humanity has had on the, on our planet, which is now visible from a cosmic perspective. I mean, the um, deforestation of the rainforests, the uh, silting up of harbors all over the world, the, um, uh, you know, burning of, of, uh, of crops and, and just uh, the, the general uh, haziness of many parts of the earth. I mean, when, when we flew over central China, you couldn't see the ground because the, the smoke pollution from the coal fires was, was so great. And, 
And so, as I say, many, many astronauts come back, I think, with much more of an ecological sensitivity than, than they had previously. Again, that, it didn't change me fundamentally because, I mean, I remember Earth Day, the very first Earth Day, I was in graduate school. I was always concerned about ecology, but, but nevertheless, when you see something firsthand, it just brings those feelings that much stronger to the surface. Sure. Well, let's move to your post-NASA work. You're currently a deputy principal investigator of the Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, otherwise known That's as MOXIE. Well, MOXIE for short. MOXIE. Uh, as NASA prepares for human exploration of, of Mars, MOXIE is designed to produce oxygen on the surface of Mars. Now, can you describe MOXIE in layman's terms and the experiment's importance? And how close do you think we are uh, to human exploration of the red planet? Well, um, first of all, um, wh when you gave the acronym, let me just explain uh, that in situ resource utilization, it basically means living off the land. So instead of anything that, that you can get once you get to Mars or the moon for that matter, or anywhere else you go, uh, rather than having to bring it with you all the way, uh, you're, you're ahead of the game because the, the cost of sending something to Mars is still pretty extraordinary, e you know, even with the, the, the advances that Elon Musk has made and, and Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin, SpaceX. Uh, the cost of spaceflight is coming down, but it's still expensive to get to Mars. Um, <clears throat> when people finally go to Mars, assuming that they want to come back home, uh, they're going to need a rocket on the surface of Mars. Now that rocket, of course, we're going to have to build on the Earth and send to Mars and land it. But that rocket needs, you know, tens of tons of, of propellant. Um, any rocket burns, it has two, two parts of the propellant. It has fuel and an oxidizer. Uh, in the case of a, a Mars, we call it a Mars ascent vehicle. If, if people have seen the movie The Martian, they, they saw, uh, you know, Mark Watney finally made his way to the ascent vehicle and it took off and, and he rendezvoused with, with his ride home. I don't think many people gave much thought to where did all the propellant come for that rocket? The, um, the, the maybe 10 tons of uh, methane and probably 30 tons of oxygen, liquid oxygen that you need for an oxidizer. Well, to send 30 tons of oxygen in cryogenic tanks all the way from the earth to Mars with the heat shields and everything you need, I mean, you, you would have to launch hundreds of tons of material off the surface of the earth just to get 30 tons of dumb old oxygen to the surface of Mars for the ascent vehicle. So if you could make that oxygen on the surface of Mars, you're way ahead of the, you've saved yourself billions of dollars. Um, and that's exactly the technology that MOXIE is going to demonstrate. What we do is uh, it's a process called electrolysis, and anyone who's gone through high school chemistry, I'm sure, has taken a beaker of water, and you put two electrodes in it, and you hook the electrodes to a battery, and sure enough, hydrogen bubbles out of one side, and oxygen bubbles out the other side, because you've used electricity to split apart a water molecule into its constituents of hydrogen and oxygen. Well, it turns out the atmosphere of Mars is, it's very thin, it's only about 1% the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere, but, but it's about 96% carbon dioxide, CO2. And you see those two oxygen atoms. Well, what MOXIE does, we, um, we, we first of all have a filter to uh, filter the dust, which, which Mars atmosphere has a lot of dust, and we don't want the dust inside all the apparatus, but then we have a compressor which takes in this very, very thin Mars atmosphere, compresses it to about half of an Earth's atmosphere worth of pressure, and then puts it into an electrolysis unit, not exactly like what you used in high school chemistry. It's solid state. I won't go into the details. but we basically do is we split 
one of those oxygen atoms out of the carbon dioxide, um, and we, we end up with essentially pure oxygen. Moxie will produce about six to 10 grams per hour, which is about enough to keep a small dog alive. Um, it's not meant for humans because right now we don't have any humans there. We're not gonna do anything with the oxygen other than to measure its purity and confirm that the process works. Um, and then we'll just release it back into the Mars atmosphere. But someday, uh, when we get serious about a human mission to Mars, if we don't want to have to carry all that oxygen from the Earth to Mars, we're going to have to have a system about 200 times the size of our MOXIE experiment, which is only, you know, the size of a large shoebox and it, it weighs maybe, you know, 15 kilograms or so, 30 pounds or roughly. Um, so it, it, you're going to have to have something uh, much bigger than that. But the basic process itself, which of course has been demonstrated on numerous occasions in laboratories here on the Earth, but um, NASA has uh, a, a rule that if, if you're going to rely on any process or, uh, or apparatus which is mission critical, and, and certainly if you're counting on uh, something to produce the oxygen so the crew can get off the surface of the planet and get back home, that's mission critical. You have to demonstrate it not just in the laboratory on Earth, even in Mars-like conditions, which we have done, but you actually have to demonstrate it in the real environment. We just want to be sure that Mars doesn't have any nasty surprises waiting for us. We expect that everything is going to work okay, but expectations and hope is not enough for mission critical uh, things, and so we, we're going to actually demonstrate it. We launched successfully as part of the uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. We're one of seven experiments. All the other experiments are designed to uh, examine Mars. Uh, our experiment, as, as I say, is really designed looking ahead towards future human exploration. We'll be landing on Mars in, on the 18th of February, and hopefully by early Mars, uh, by early March, we will have, for the first time, produced oxygen on the surface of Mars. Well, you can feel the excitement building. I think after the moon, uh, in terms of um, how the public views space um, over, over a period of years, and we'll go back to Flash Gordon um, and Martians, I think there's, there's that, that special interest in Mars, and, and we'll be watching this one closely. Um, I, I have one last question, and it's a kind of a question of the moment. Uh, I'd be interested in getting your thoughts on it. Obviously, you experience remoteness while on each of your missions. You've talked about that. Let's talk about how being in space uh, prepared you for some of the same conditions caused by the pandemic, or, or shall we say lessons for all of us in what you may have learned in this time of distancing and isolation and being removed from, from friends and family, from work. Uh, how do you see it? Well, um, the thing is, in all of my space flights, and, and this is certainly true for people currently, uh, human space flight is being conducted up in the International Space Station. But you ask anybody who's been up in the space station or anyone who's been on a shuttle flight like me, I mean, we were busy all the time. Uh, there's just a lot of work to do. You don't really have time to get lonely or, or worry about the, the isolation. Um, obviously, it's a little different situation up in the space station where they're separated from their friends and their families for six months at a time or even longer. Um, but they're always busy. Uh, I, I, and, and, you know, for me, I'm, I uh, am still working. Uh, we're, we're doing all our preparations for the MOXIE mission uh, remotely, but nevertheless, um, I'm, I'm as busy as I ever was. So uh, for, for me, um, the isolation has been inconvenient. Uh, you know, I, I miss being able to go out to the theater and, and concerts, but, um, but I haven't gotten bored. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't have cabin fever or anything. 
So um, we, NASA thinks a lot about that, though, when we do talk about someday sending people to Mars, because that's a, depending on, you know, how close the Earth and Mars are at the time, that's anywhere from a seven to eight month one way journey each way. And unlike being in orbit around the Earth, where if you do have some free time, you can always look out the window. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I never get tired of look, looking at the Earth. Um, and even the Apollo astronauts, uh, you know, they were circling the moon. They, they could look at the moon below them. They could, they could look back and see the Earth uh, up in the sky. Not when you're on your way to Mars. Once, once you leave the Earth-Moon system, all you're going to see out the window is stars for months and months and months. It's going to be totally unvarying. And NASA is quite concerned about the long-term impact of uh, monotony and boredom. I think the, the solution is, uh, you know, figure out some useful, uh, interesting activities that, that you can do that, um, you know, if you just sit around uh, and, and, and mope about being isolated, uh, you know, sure enough, the isolation gets worse and, and it's much harder to take. If, if you can invest your emotional and psychic energy into something that you're enthusiastic about, um, that I think is the best way of coping with prolonged isolation. Well, those are good words to live by. Jeff, you've, um, you've been a real national hero. I mean, anybody who watched the repair of the Hubble telescope, uh, we were waiting with bated breath. Uh, and, but more than that, you know, each community in, in our country has its, has its role models and its heroes. And you certainly are one. The Space Torah, even though it is in Houston, I think is um, you know, all of us have a, have a part in it and, have a, and, and share a great deal of pride uh, in the fact uh, that you took, um, yes, a transportable religious object for sure, uh, but the most meaningful uh, religious article, religious object that we have uh, into space. And, um, you know, I think about it when you think of how not, not that many years before, you know, um, we were nearly uh, destroyed as a people uh, and then there you were uh, taking all of these religious articles into space. So we're, we're deeply appreciative uh, for that. If I could just make one more comment about that, uh, which, which um, I, I actually made this comment up in space when I, after I had performed the ceremony, but um, you know, why do it? The, uh, we, we take many objects, uh, you know, banners from organizations, pins, and, and people get really excited. You know, this, this thing is special because it was in space. Um, you, you can't really make a Torah any more special in, in, in a, a deep sense. I mean, it, it, it's a holy object. Um, and for me, uh, it, the, the idea of, of bringing the, the holiness of Torah and the Jewish tradition into space made space special. In other words, it, it brought this part of human culture, of my culture, into space for the first time. And, and that, I thought, was the real significance of the space Torah. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Well, Jeff, thank you for your incredible work and for changing the way we look at the world and for being with us today. And a pleasure. Huge thanks to Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman for speaking with me, and thank you for tuning in to this conversation with B'nai B'rith. If you like what you hear, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn more about our important work. See you again. Take care, everyone.